Hello and welcome to Governing Pandemics 101, a course offered by the Global Health Center of the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva. My name is Professor Surimu, and I'll be presenting the second mini lecture uh, here in the first session um, on the global challenge of governing pandemics. In the second mini lecture, I'll be covering the weaknesses that were exposed by COVID-19 and what are the proposals that are currently on the agenda to reform and strengthen the global system. So first, a few um, uh, comments just to set the context. If we think about uh, the, the crisis of COVID-19 and in terms of the direct health effects, we've had uh, literally hundreds of millions of documented uh, infections and many, many more um, uh, that have not been confirmed. We have about 20 million estimated excess deaths. We have uh, long COVID, which will have consequences for individuals for years to come, uh, which we don't fully understand yet. In terms of some of the indirect health effects, we have many, many cases where people have delayed or foregone seeking health care. We have health care workers who have become ill, who have died, who have burned out uh, and left the health workforce. And we have, of course, just seen the tip of the iceberg in terms of the mental health effects of this pandemic. In terms of the economic impacts, uh, it's very difficult to, to estimate the magnitude of the losses, but one estimate puts it at $5 trillion of economic losses. Uh, in the high-income countries that were able to mobilize an economic um, uh, rescue package, they spent between 20 and 50 percent of GDP in trying to react to the economic contraction that we've seen. Over 120 million people are estimated to have been pushed below the international poverty line as a result of this pandemic. When we think about the students who had to miss school, 1.6 billion students who were directly affected by school closures with long-term impacts that we don't yet understand in terms of their future learning, uh, their mental health, and their, their uh, lifetime earnings about a 9% drop in labor in working hours as a result of the pandemic, a 75% drop in tourism, one of the sectors that was hit the hardest. And of course, human rights abuses uh, that affected many, many different groups, uh, such as women and girls, uh, such as irregular workers, such as migrants, and many other marginalized populations. I think it's fair to say, through this quick run through some of the impacts of this pandemic, that this is one of the, the greatest, if not the greatest, shared global crisis since the end of the Second World War. Of course, this pandemic has exposed the fault lines in societies at national level, but also very much exposed how weak and fragile and inadequate our global system is for preparing and responding to pandemics. There were a series of international reviews that were organized, um, many of which delivered their findings in the middle of 2021. So for example, you had the WHO Independent Panel on Pandemic Preparedness and Response. We had the uh, International Health Regulations Review Committee we had the WHO Health Emergencies Program that had its own uh, independent uh, oversight review. We have the uh, Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, which has issued uh, its analysis and recommendations, and a G20 high-level panel that focused in particular on financing for preventing and responding to future pandemics. What I'll offer you over the next few minutes is a quick summary, basically, of all of the um, uh, challenges and the weaknesses that were diagnosed in this series of uh, expert reports. And I'll divide them among three major categories. The first is weaknesses in preventing and preparing for uh, pandemics, Set the second in responding to them, and then what are some of the cross-cutting issues across. So first, when we think about prevention and preparedness for pandemics, it's clear that almost no country in the world was adequately prepared for the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition to that, at the international level, we have inadequate means to actually track, uh, to monitor, and to hold countries accountable, in fact, for that national preparedness. And of course, weakness in one country can have implications for all countries uh, in, in the global system. We also had a, a wholesale neglect, I would say, of some of the upstream risks, for example, that pathogens could jump from animals or the environment to humans, an underappreciation of how important a risk this was. Next, if we move to the category of uh, detection and response, we had a whole host of, uh, of weaknesses, again, that were exposed at the international level. 
So first, insufficient arrangements to ensure that information and data would be shared across uh, borders quickly. Uh, insufficient arrangements for pathogen samples and the data related to those and the benefits that would derive from those samples, such as diagnostics or vaccines. Uh, those were not adequately or quickly shared across borders. When we think about the international health regulations, which I won't focus on today because those are the, se the focus of, um, of session two, but there were a number of problems with the way the international health regulations uh, were applied. Uh, weaknesses with the way an international emergency was declared, both before and after the declaration. Um, problems with the way trade and travel restrictions were governed. We had oftentimes uh, complete chaos, in fact, in the way trade and travel restrictions were implemented. Uh, Wide-ranging problems with compliance and enforcement with the commitments that governments had made uh, through the international health regulations. And again, this will be the focus of, of a future session. Uh, unequal uh, and highly inequitable access to countermeasures such as vaccines, drugs, diagnostics, personal protective equipment uh, linked to a whole host of problems such that some populations were highly protected in some of the wealthiest countries of the world, whereas other populations had to go largely without for many, many months and even years now into this pandemic. And of course, uh, misinformation, oftentimes intentional disinformation, a lack of public trust, which we now understand was one of the most important ingredients in effective responses at societal level and failures of political leadership across the board. Now, when we think about what are some of the cross-cutting issues, preparedness, prevention, detection, and response, the first is financing, inadequate uh, degrees of investment across the board. Second, an underpowered WHO. So a, a WHO that had been asked to carry out a number of uh, important functions for the international community, but was not financed nor given the legal or political uh, uh, mandate or tools to do so. Um, poor coordination between the human health sector and the many, many other sectors uh, that are needed in order to actually effectively respond to pandemics, such as trade, um, agriculture, uh, intellectual property investment, etc. And last but not least, very, very weak and inadequate arrangements for monitoring and accountability of the system overall. So as you can see, there's a very long list of uh, weaknesses and sort of gaping holes, uh, if you will, at the global health system. Many recommendations that have been put forward. What I'd like to do is just, just simplify some of these and show you in this diagram, what are some instruments of global governance? What do we try to uh, use in order to try to be, um, to mobilize more effective uh, international action? So you can see that rules such as treaties, uh, agreements, codes of conduct are one area. Uh, and rules are, of course, related to financing. Um, and the kinds of rules that we agree to can shape the kinds of finance that is mobilized. Uh, and you can see that financing, of course, has an impact on organizations, organizational mandates for WHO, as well as, well as many other organizations. How do organizations work together? Uh, and of course, the way organizations work together can have an influence on the kinds of rules that are ultimately developed, whether or not countries and other actors uh, comply with them, etc. So these three tools are important. And you can see a number of the proposals, the reform proposals that have been put on the table and are actively being considered today have to do with either rules, financing, organizations, or the arrangements that tie all three of these together. So now we're going to turn to proposals for reform, and these fall across three broad categories. There are proposals to strengthen uh, existing rules, financing, organizations, arrangements, proposals to create new ones, and pilot initiatives that at a smaller scale have already begun to move forward to try to do so. So when we look at strengthening existing rules, financing, uh, organizations, and arrangements, there are, for example, processes now to revise and amend the international health regulations. This will be covered in the next session. Um, processes to try to strengthen uh, the governance and the financing of the World Health Organization, for example. Uh, proposals to try to improve the work of the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator, called the ACT Accelerator, which includes a number of the largest organization here in Geneva working in global health, such as Gavi, such as the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, uh, such as the Global Fund to Fight uh, HIV, AIDS, TB, and Malaria, UNITAID, the Medicines Patent Pool, FIND, and others. So all of these have to do with strengthening the existing uh,
uh, arrangements. But there have also been many proposals put forward to create new rules. So, for example, the Pandemic Treaty, for which negotiations have begun at the Dobe Show uh, within uh, the uh, Intergovernmental Negotiating Body, which will also be covered in the next session. Proposals for uh, new uh, modes of financing, such as the Global Health Threats Fund, which uh, has been proposed to be created at the World Bank as a financial intermediary fund, as it's been called. Proposals for new um, uh, arrangements or initiatives, such as a Global Health Threats Council, which would be comprised of heads of state to try to uh, ensure that this kind of uh, letting down our guard doesn't happen again. Or a Global Health Threats Board, which would be operating at the ministerial level. All of these, uh, as of today, do remain proposals, but they are being quite actively debated. And one of the key debates is, of course, to what extent should we create new um, institutions versus trying to strengthen uh, and build on the ones that we already have. Meanwhile, what we've had is the piloting of a number of new smaller scale initiatives that have tried to already take and apply some of the lessons that have been learned. So for example, there is a peer review mechanism to uh, assess uh, national preparedness, which is modeled off the UN Human Rights Council, already a pilot that is underway. We have the biohub that has been created here in Switzerland to try to improve the international flow of pathogen samples and related benefits. Um, you have the uh, similar or related creation of the WHO Pandemic Intelligence Hub that was recently launched in Berlin to be able to share data more uh, quickly and equitably across countries. And, for example, the creation of an mRNA hub to uh, transfer technology for the production of mRNA vaccines, uh, which has been created uh, by WHO and the government of South Africa in South Africa, as well as a newly uh, launched uh, hub for technology transfer to produce biologics um, uh, created by the WHO and the government of South Korea. So you can see lots and lots of initiatives uh, at the global level and also initiative not just at the global level but also at the regional level. For example, the creation of a new uh, Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Authority, HERA, at the European Union level. Um, two comments to make about this host of proposals to create, um, to revise, or to pilot new, uh, new reforms. First is that you can see they're operating at multiple levels. I gave a number, example, a number of examples of global initiatives, but also regional initiatives at the European Union, at the African Union, for example, uh, among clubs of like-minded countries, such as, such as the G7, G20, other groupings, and of course, many, many initiatives at the national level. So you have reform processes happening simultaneously at multiple levels. The second is that these reform debates are happening across multiple arenas. WHO is uh, one of the central and more important arenas, I would argue, but you also have many, many processes happening at the UN General Assembly, at the World Trade Organization, at the G7 and the G20, as I mentioned, at the World Bank, at the Food and Agriculture Organization, the UN Human Rights Council. And a couple takeaways from the fact that all of these reform proposals are being uh, a couple implications, I should say, of the fact that these reform proposals are being considered in so many different arenas at the global level. First is that for those of you who are interested in a very specific issue, um, of course, it, it's important to follow those debates, for example, in the WTO or in the, uh, in the FAO or in the, the International Labour Organization. But the second implication is that for smaller entities, smaller governments, smaller organizations, smaller media outlets, it's very, very difficult, in fact, to follow uh, and to engage and influence all of these different processes happening at the same time in multiple places and in multiple levels. And you can see the power dynamics and the power disparities are going to be quite tremendous in, um, in engaging in these reform processes. To add to this, there's an, uh, another layer of complexity, which is that we are not dealing with the blank slate here. A number of these reforms have indeed tried to strengthen existing arrangements, um, but indeed we, we are not talking about a blank slate, but of course a set of uh, many pre-existing rules, uh, organizations, uh, mandates um, that are needed 
to effectively respond to pandemics, but have often operated uh, separately from each other. So here I show you what we call the flower diagram. You can see in the inner petal a number of the different issues that I've just mentioned have been identified as problems or weaknesses in the global system in COVID-19. What you can see in the outer uh, rim of this flower is a number of pre-existing uh, international treaties or organizations, uh, sets of rules or norms or practices that already try to govern each of these areas. So when we think about governing pandemics, when we think about trying to in fact ensure that in the future the world would be better prepared, it's not enough to only look in that inner circle, but we also have to look at what is happening in this outer circle. And again, major, major challenges, uh, especially for less well-resourced actors. Uh, three key takeaways um, from, from this uh, session. The first is that the global health system, international arrangements overall have been patchy, weak, and certainly wholly inadequate in scope and scale to indeed uh, address, address pandemics. Uh, the second key takeaway is that there are a wide range of changes that are needed and that have been proposed uh, having to do with international rules, international financing, international organizations, and the arrangement that bind them together, such as monitoring and accountability arrangements, for example. Last but not least, WHO is a central arena, but certainly not the only one. Uh, many, many other arenas operating at multiple levels where you can uh, engage in shaping the debates and the decision making. This is a major challenge, but it also means there are many, many different points of entry. So with that, I'll wrap up. Thank you very much, and we'll move now to our comprehension questions.